Hello everyone, my name is Ben Blakely and for this case study presentation, I chose to explore former ESPN NBA reporter Rachel Nichols' disparaging comments involving diversity at the network. First, some background on the case. Nichols' comments go back to July 2020 in the lead up to the resumption of the NBA season and playoffs, which were exclusively played in the NBA bubble at Walt Disney World in Florida due to the coronavirus pandemic. While completing her mandatory seven-day quarantine, Nichols had a phone conversation with Adam Mendelson, then a longtime PR advisor to the Los Angeles Lakers, and Rich Paul, agent of LA superstars LeBron James and Anthony Davis. The conversation was centered around hopes of setting up an interview with both players, according to Kevin Draper of the New York Times. But as the 20-minute conversation went on, found exclusively by Draper and the Times, Nichols addresses her frustration as to why ESPN was giving NBA Finals pre- and post-game hosting duties to Maria Taylor, who was African-American. Throughout the 20-minute conversation between the three parties, multiple topics, including the history of diversity at ESPN, were discussed. But the one that gained the most spotlight was Nichols' comments about Taylor getting the hosting duties for the Finals. She said, Quote, if you need to give her more things to do because you are feeling pressure about your crappy long-time record on diversity, which by the way I know personally from the female side of it, like go for it. Just find it somewhere else. You're not going to find it from me or take my thing away. End quote. But here's the problem. What Nichols did not know was that her camera, which she used to record her daily appearances on the jump and spots for other ESPN programming while staying at the hotel, was rolling and feeding the footage to ESPN's headquarters in Bristol, Connecticut. According to the Times, the video was recorded by an unnamed employee and shared throughout the company, which also included comments from Mendelssohn on how Nichols should respond to ESPN given the hosting duties to Taylor. After the recording was made public, Mendelssohn released a statement saying he believed Taylor, quote, deserved and earned the position and Rachel must accept it, end quote. Nichols also tried reaching out to Taylor via text message and multiple phone calls to apologize, but those were never returned. She also gave an on-TV apology to the network and Maria Taylor for her comments on the jump days later, saying in part, quote, I also don't want to let this moment pass without saying how much I respect, how much I value our colleagues here at ESPN, how deeply, deeply sorry I am for disappointing those I hurt, particularly Maria Taylor, and how grateful I am to be part of this outstanding team, end quote. John Krulitz, the Vice President of Communications for the 24-7 Sports Network, told the New York Times that they, quote, fairly considered all the facts related to the incident and then addressed the situation appropriately and have their focus remain on Maria, Rachel, and the rest of the talented team collectively serving NBA fans, end quote. So what was the fallout of Nichols' comments? Well, after Draper's article for the New York Times was published, Nichols was pulled from all ESPN programming and had her show, The Jump, canceled. She never returned to ESPN programming and reached a settlement with the network in January, according to the New York Post. It is not known where she is working now, as she has been inactive on her Twitter page, but there are rumors that she is back working for CNN and Turner Sports, but that is unknown. Kayla Johnson who worked as a digital video producer at ESPN and Draper mentions in his New York Times piece, was originally suspended for two weeks after admitting to HR that she sent the video to Maria Taylor. Johnson eventually left the network after her suspension. And Maria Taylor, who was the subject of Nichols' comments, chose to leave the network because of partly failed contract extension talks, according to Joe Hernandez of NPR. She is now working at NBC Sports and was named host of Football Night in America in May. In this case involving primarily Nichols, Mariah Taylor, and ESPN itself, there are three ethical questions that come up. One, should Nichols have been told her camera was on while she was having the private conversation with Mendelssohn and Paul? Two, did the network do the right or wrong thing and wait to reprimand Nichols for her comments? And three, do comments like these show a diversity problem in media? Each question, including its relevance to journalists and citizens, is broken down on its own slide. The concept of being told you are being recorded is an ethical dilemma that journalists and citizens both face. Devices such as our smartphones and smart watches have given both groups recording capabilities with the click of a button. But there are different laws in each state regarding consenting to being recorded that both journalists and citizens should know. Now you may be wondering why I put the state maps of Florida and Connecticut here. 
Caldwell, Florida, where the conversation took place with Mendelssohn, Nichols, and Paul in Connecticut, where the feed was being recorded and sent to, have two-party statutes, meaning both parties must consent to being recorded. The consequences could include lawsuits from Nichols, Mendelssohn, and Paul against ESPN for recording their conversation without their consent. But on the other side, the mix-up could be labeled a hot mic incident, as Nichols may have not known her camera was on due to everyone adapting to this new form of reporting during COVID. It might be an honest mistake, or this recording of the comments could have opened Pandora's box of diversity issues that ESPN has tried to and sometimes struggled to grasp in their history. The recording aspect pushes the legality and social aspect for journalists and the general population as both groups need to understand the potential issues and consequences of doing so. With Nichols' comments, it begs the question, do actions have consequences? In this case, her comments go back to July 2020. While well, citizens and journalists may look at the recorded conversation, which was reportedly leaked to the media, and wonder why the network chose not to address the issue right after it happened and pulled her from ESPN programming. Nichols' comments came to light over a year after they occurred. And as Draper addresses in his article for the Times, ESPN allowed Nichols to report from the sidelines and routinely appear in ESPN NBA coverage, whether it be pre-recorded or a live spot as these comments were circulating throughout the ESPN offices and before the general public knew. It may make the public question whether ESPN is transparent enough and if there could be less accountability for media personnel with similar comments. But it brings up another question. If Nichols was removed immediately as an NBA reporter, could the public and journalists alike begin to question where she is until she spills the beans as to why she disappeared? And this brings Kayla Johnson, the digital video producer who sent the video to Taylor, into the debate. Should she have been suspended and had her reputation tarnished because she was informing Taylor about these controversial comments by one of her co-workers? These questions throw the First Amendment debate regarding freedom of speech for citizens and journalists to consider. If either group says or writes something that may be deemed controversial, should they be reprimanded immediately or allow time to pass before what was said is in the public eye? It becomes a compelling debate, as both decisions could have positive consequences, meaning the person is held accountable, or negative ones, such as the bad PR and image ESPN may gain from waiting to address the controversy. Diversity is a problem the media industry has been trying to solve, and is a topic of our studies this semester. As Bill Kovach and Tom Rosenstiel talk about in the elements of journalism, a default culture begins to harden in a newsroom when everyone is supposed to think the same way, not when their differences are encouraged to broaden how the news is created, end quote. This often creates white and male-dominated newsrooms and coverage. And as Taylor pointed out in an email to HR two weeks after the incident, which was found exclusively by the New York Times, quote, I will not call myself a victim. But I certainly have felt victimized, and I do not feel as though my complaints have been taken seriously. In fact, the first time I have heard from HR after two incidents of racial insensitivity was to ask if I leaked Rachel's tape to the media. I would never do that. End quote. But how do the citizen and journalist fit into this case? Well, both have a role in changing the diverse culture of media. The journalist's role would be to expose these indifferences to management and fight for change. In this case, Kevin Draper of the Times pointed out these comments but left the fight for change argument to the side. That is where the citizens come in, as they share the job of pointing out these issues and demand more diversity in newsrooms and coverage of their communities. According to the 2021 Sports Media Racial and Gender Report Card published by the Institute of Diversity and Ethics in Sport, or TIDES, the sports media industry received a C for their overall grade on diversity and had a B plus in racial hiring but received an F in gender hiring. In ESPN's case, the network is considered a trailblazer for diversity. As the Tides report noted that if ESPN was omitted from the study, there would be significant drops in people of color being assistant sports editors and women being sports editors. If citizens and journalists do not speak up about the lack of diversity, the hardening concept of a white and male dominated media landscape could continue. But if they speak up, there could be a shift towards more diverse newsrooms and voices telling stories whether it be about community outreach, politics, sports, or other topics. So with now knowing the background on this case, as well as the ethical questions that come out from it, how would you solve this case involving Rachel Nichols, ESPN, and Maria Taylor? I'm very interested to see how you would respond, 
and I'd like to thank you for watching this presentation on this case study.